Hi, and welcome to the Man Cow Foundation. In this video, inspired by Leonard Reed and Milton Friedman, we consider the story of a simple pencil, but how it's actually the product of an international supply chain. And more interestingly, how probably none of the people involved in that supply chain actually knew that their individual efforts would go into producing a pencil. From the timber plantation workers in America to the Malaysian rubber plantation workers who made the eraser, right to the people in the paint shop who gave it this uh, red and black striped painting. None of them actually got together to conspire to produce a pencil. However, as the Soviet and Cuban model shows us, the efforts of people operating on the free, open market trading goods and services actually give us a better and cheaper product than an in-house, end-to-end process that's directed by a central authority. To find out why this is the case, check out our video and please feel welcome to leave any comments or questions at the end. Okay, so welcome here today. Now, what we want to talk about here is the, the issue of international trade. It's a big touchstone issue at the moment. Uh, there have, just in the last 24 hours, been sanctions uh, placed against Russia by America, which a lot of people weren't expecting. The current administration has been accused of being too close to Russia. And now they've launched a new round of trade barriers. There's a lot of uh, talk about a trade war with China. And what, what I want to focus on today is the fact that, look, trade really makes us richer. Now, we recommended readings um, from Milton Friedman and Leonard Reed, specifically the I Pencil uh, presentation. And Milton Friedman and Leonard Reed are actually friends of Ron Manners through the Mont Pelerin Society. It's actually Leonard Reed who founded the Foundation for Economic Education, uh, which Mancal sponsors students to. Uh, as I said before, talk to our scholarships director about that. And it was through uh, Leonard Reed and uh, Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE, that Ron Manners himself was first introduced to free markets and trade. Now, the eye pencil video really explains how a pencil is made up of so many different component parts that no one person in the world could produce themselves. So I just pulled one out here earlier and you know, we think of a pencil as a very simple thing, but you've got the wood in it first of all that could have come from a plantation really anywhere. And likewise for the red and black paint on it. The, it's got the little eraser on the end. If I was going to pick any country, maybe Malaysia um, is where that could have come from. Uh, the little collar that holds it in place there, again, it could have been mined anywhere. But the uh, mining equipment may well have been, uh, may well be caterpillar um, equipment. Uh, the, it could have been built with steel out of China, with iron ore, originally from Australia. Uh, the rubber plantation, by the way, um, they're very common in Malaysia. But as it turns out, it's, rubber is not a native plant to Malaysia. So next time you fly into Malaysia and to Kale Airport and you go over miles upon miles of rubber plantations, they're actually originally brought over from South America and are sponsored in part by the British government, who were the colonial rulers at the time and wanted to build a new industry out of Malaysia. We've got uh, the pencil lead, which is actually made of graphite, which again could have been mined anywhere in the world, and the glue that holds it together, again, could have come from uh, anywhere. So almost like magic, you've got a pencil that's created out of process that wasn't actually deliberately designed to create a pencil. It involved thousands of people across an international supply chain, but all of those people were working independently within their own little part of the supply chain. So the forest owner, for example, employed timber workers who cut down trees. None of them had in mind that they were going out that day 
to eventually create a pencil out of logs that they were chopping down. All the thousands of people across that supply chain will never meet each other. They won't know each other exists. If they did meet, they might not get along. They might be from different countries, different nationalities, different religions. But they all work together yet separately to ensure that this pencil materialises in the lowest cost, cheapest and best manner possible. And that happens without a centralised management company, with no orders being laid down by a government department about the size, the colour, the number of pencils, when and where they'll be produced and so forth. It all happens thanks to the magic of the price system. Now, just looking at the iPhone, if we thought that this simple product was uh, created by a complex supply chain, the iPhone takes it to the next level. So, it has hundreds of suppliers from the lowest to highest levels of technology all around the world. You've got blue collar, white collar workers, uh, manufacturing to engineering design, marketing, finance, law, everyone on, all on top of each other there in this highly convoluted sort of supply chain. Uh, due to the specialised nature of the iPhone and the scale that it, they're created on, uh, there are a number of component suppliers that are set up as dedicated suppliers just to Apple for the iPhone. But many, of course, are not. Uh, the people do the, the, the plastics, for example, aren't necessarily supplying only to iPhone. And of course, where that plastic is derived from, oil, well, BP doesn't have a specific well that supplies oil only to a refinery, that only supplies to a particular plastics factory, that only supplies to Apple. And... Even though it's dedicated to this one iPhone product, it will still work independently of the rest of that complicated supply chain. And like I said, they will be relying on input sources, so metals, silicon and more, that are not produced with only that iPhone in mind. If we scroll down, this is a list of all the different countries that have firms involved and the number of firms in each country next to it. it really, that list really puts it into perspective. You've got from rich to poor, you've got uh, across uh, a number of uh, continents, and all, uh, each one of them specialising in a particular area. We have three in Italy and three in Ireland because the Italians were the best suppliers for three components. The Irish, the best for three components, including their law and taxation regime, which the uh, you may be aware the EU has uh, had some concerns about lately. Now, here's an example of the specialisation and gains from trade that are involved uh, in in Apple's iPhone. So, China has a clear comparative advantage versus the US in terms of mobilising factory workers and supervisors. Now, you think of the number of new iPhones that are created and sold and they're launched around the world generally on one specific day. Unfortunately, Australia can get the product a few days or up to a couple of weeks later. But it's all launched at once, and the product lead time is not long. So you really have to do these things at a massive scale. Otherwise, by the time you get your iPhone 8, we'll be up to iPhone 27. Because China is such a large country with such a, uh, hard, uh, a large population, which has uh, such a massive industrial manufacturing base, but it has a comparative advantage there. Uh, scale also perhaps less regulated manner of recruitment and employment in China. It can just be much easier to go and get things done uh, as opposed to recruitment processes in the West. It can be a bit more protracted, involve um, a lot more legalese and, and other requirements. But yeah, China, you get the whole thing going in 50 day, 15 days. USA, it's a nine-month lead time. 
as consumers, we don't want to be waiting nine months just for the manufacturing process of the next iPhone to be launched. Now, were the iPhone to be ent entirely assembled in the US, the final product cost would only increase by $4. That's the really interesting thing about it. There are a lot of accusations that companies offshore, so that they can pay very low wages, that they save a huge amount of money and all the rest. It's really not a cost thing that's involved. If you're going to pay, I read that the next iPhone is expected to be about $1,400, so an extra $4 on the final ticket price is neither here nor there. Uh, the manufacturing strategy is actually motivated more by scalability, as I mentioned before, and supply chain risk rather than cost. However, Apple uh, are well aware that the tax they pay on profits overseas is in the range of about 2%, hence the, uh, the designation in Ireland. Were they to manufacture in the US, they'd have to pay a up to 35% profit tax on the sale of each iPhone. So it's estimated that were they to bring the iPhone on shore to the US with all its manufacturing, although there'd only be the $4 uh, uh, increase in actual unit costs, the tax would result in a high bill of $4.2 billion. So the, the incentive really is there to run a, an international supply chain. It has the scale that you need, it manages risk better, and you have a lower tax liability in all. So really what that comes down to is that other countries have a comparative advantage in their tax and regulatory environments, and that's an advantage that Apple is uh, very keen to trade with. Now we go over to the issue of specialisation. Who, who here has studied economics? Yeah. This is probably something that you would have heard about early in your macro uh, side of uh, study your degree. We have to ask why do we go through this messy process that we had on the previous page with all the dots and all different countries and 349 firms in China alone. Well, the reason why we go through such a messy process is because different firms and countries specialise in different products. So, at that micro level, hundreds of years ago, the economist Frederick Bastiat, uh, he's quoted extensively in the yellow and blue book that we have on the table there, he said that if a baker needs meat and bread, and a butcher needs meat, meat and bread, they're both better off spending their whole day focusing on their specialty. So the baker bakes all the bread he can, the butcher gets all the meat uh, ready that he can, and at the end of the day they swap. Because if the baker tries to also tend to a herd, and the butcher while tending to this herd is running back in to check on the oven to make sure his bread isn't burning, they'll both end up with an inferior outcome, as opposed to had they actually traded. But at the macro level, that means that Australia needs to concentrate on our strengths. Uh, take Switzerland, for example. They have a lot of advantages. Some of the most uh, obvious ones are clocks, chocolate and skiing holidays. Now, Australia has an advantage in iron ore and beach holidays. So the Barrier Reef, Ningaloo, Cottesloe Beach, they're all a lot better than sitting on the shores of Lake Geneva. It's very pretty, but if you want a beach holiday, you're not going to get it in the landlocked country of Switzerland. Similarly, Swiss ski resorts, some of the best in the world. WA doesn't have any, or we can fly over the eastern states where, the, where they have to check the, uh, the snow reports. Uh, Switzerland doesn't have a problem with snow. Um, we each become wealthier in that way by concentrating on our own strengths and trading them. Now how we identify those strengths is via the open market and the price system. So, and that's where we can compare prices 
product variety and quality and then make up our own minds and make our own decisions. Uh, because uh, you see, an economy is fundamentally a grassroots, bottom-up kind of mechanism, an informal mechanism. So that means there are billions of small decisions involved every day in every purchase that everyone makes across the economy, rather having, than having a central direction from Canberra saying who is going to take a skiing holiday to Switzerland and when. I mean, for a simple analogy, you all came here today. Uh, some of you, well, first of all, you decided that in your estimation the benefits of being here outweighed the costs of coming and the benefits of being somewhere else at this time. Now, you all came by various means. Some of you came by public transport. I heard that it was running a bit late today. Others drove. Um, some may have got dropped off by friends. Some may have walked. Now, the walkers may have looked outside and decided it wasn't very nice weather, but it was still worth saving the bus fare or saving money on petrol and uh, trying to find parking. And likewise, people came via bus, may have decided that it was better than trying to fight traffic here in Subiaco, than trying to get around the construction work down the street, and again, you didn't want to waste time having to park. You all made up those decisions for yourself, each one of you facing pretty much the same set of parameters and costs, but each weighing it up according to your own preferences. And that's why these things have to be a bottom-up affair, quite simply because no one in Canberra knows what your preferences are and can decide them for you. Now, um, the marginal costs for those of you who came by bus, the marginal costs of transfers carrying you on a bus would be next to nothing. And the fare that you paid the bus driver uh, far outweighs those marginal costs. But for you, it was worth exchanging that money rather than choosing another means of transport. So in that case, both you and Transperth ended up better off for that decision, for that trade, because you both came from backgrounds where you had different strengths, different needs and wants. Now, there's another way of looking at the world. It's a model that has been around for a long time. It's been done. It's still being done right now. Uh, countries like North Korea, to a large extent Cuba, I've gone and seen it there myself, and it doesn't work terribly well. I mean, this, and the, uh, we call it the Soviet model to keep it pretty simple. So what would you do here in the Soviet Union if you wanted a pencil? We'd have to go down to your local people's store and hope that they had pencils in stock. You could probably rely on the fact that they'd figured out that people may want pencils. But it would be an entirely different supply chain altogether. You'd start with a forest, the people's forest, all owned by the government. Um, then there'd be a people's wood mill just nearby that would chop that forest up. You'd uh, have nearby a graphite mine to mine the lead for the pencil. Now you'd hope that they actually have graphite in that country, otherwise they may pull something of less quality up, maybe coal, um, anything that'll make a mark. Then of course you need your own paint factory. You're not bringing Torbmans or Dulux or other uh, uh, paint products from around the world. You'd need the, uh, the People's Paint Cooperative. Then of course uh, it's not just about wood paint and lead, you'd also need the rubber. So you'd need your own rubber plantation. Now unfortunately in uh, countries like Russia and North Korea they don't really have the climate for rubber plantations. And Cuba's a small island so you couldn't really fit too many rubber trees across it but apparently they'd figure something out, or they may come up with some kind of resin or gel or something. They'd probably be far inferior to standard rubber, but their choice. Uh, then of course you need the little metal collar to keep it all in place. You'd need the people's mining uh, firm. 
to dig up the metal and of course then you need someone to refine it and create this little collar shape. Then you'd have your pencil factory, the people's pencil factory there, probably sitting right next door to all of this and taking in all the components from all these dedicated uh, local producers and this fellow's taking his instructions on how many pencils to produce and what colour, uniformly yellow by the look of it, from the People's Ministry of Pencils in Pyongyang or Moscow or wherever it may be. So saying, hooray, we're all self-sufficient, we've sorted this for ourselves, we have our pencil, we've done it all ourselves, magnificent, we don't need to rely on the outside world, if we have a war, don't worry, we can still make our own pencils and uh, no one can deny us uh, products or, or uh, sink the pencil carrying ships on, on the way over to us. So it sounds simple, straightforward, efficient. Why would it not be then the best way? You're just getting down to it and doing it. Well, it's like a lot of things in life really. It'd be nice if it were that easy. Free marketeers are often called call mean or uncaring because you don't go for the sort of simple, straightforward, man on the street knows best kind of designs. But sometimes those designs can work. When things get a bit more complex, unfortunately it gets a bit more complex in the solutions that you have to deal with. It'd be nice if it were as easy as the Soviet model. Unfortunately it's not, for a number of reasons. So of course you're assuming that you have all the resources to make the best, cheapest pencil in the world. But that's like assuming that Switzerland could have the best surf breaks and coral reefs in the world. All they have to do is go ahead and do it. And being a landlocked country, unfortunately they don't. So unfortunately this model is bound to have low quality because you're assuming that you can get all the best components in the world. Um, I, this is a photo I got off the internet of a Cuban shop. These are one of the shops that local people have to go to. I visited there a couple of years ago and it's basically like this. Very few products, all completely rubbish and the lady there working behind the counter, although this looks like a hokey little shop, it's actually a government owned shop and she is a public servant working in there. All entirely owned by the government as a public servant, not in the nicest of work conditions, she doesn't really have many incentives to put a great effort into providing the best products at the best prices and listening to what her customers want. So look, even if you have all the equipment you need, even if you have uh, caterpillar mining equipment, even if you have graphite, all the, uh, all the other things, really are you sh can you be sure that you have the best in the world all in your own country? No. You're not going to have WA School of Mines mining engineers. You're not going to have, if you're on a small island of Cuba, massive plantations of low-cost rubber. Even worse, if you're in the USSR, the old USSR in, uh, in Russia, you're not going to have any of that stuff at all. Uh, you might have to substitute, as I said before, for inferior products. Uh, similarly, if you shut out the world's, uh, or most of the world's supplies and only concentrate on people at home, you're almost certain not to get the cheapest and that'll make your product more expensive. That's why Australia doesn't produce uh, textiles and footwear anymore. We can get them all so much cheaper from overseas. Um, it'd be nice if we had some of those older world uh, occupations, if we could buy Australian for a lot of these things, but the reality is if you're going to be paying someone a minimum wage uh, into the twenties of dollars an hour, you're not going to get a nice pair of shoes for seventy-five dollars uh, on the special off the internet, you're going to be paying much more. Your variety would also be low uh, not only because you don't have the resources yourself, but because in this case, where you have the Ministry of Pencils deciding how many pencils and what colour and where they'll be sent, you don't have that mechanism of capturing consumer feedback and demand. 
You're not talking to customers. You're not at the level of the bureaucrat in Canberra or in Moscow. You're not in touch so you can see whether products are moving or not. And really, you don't have the incentive, particularly under that old um, Soviet model. They actually focus on producing things, not actually getting things sold. That's one of the reasons the Soviet Union crashed. They're some of the world's biggest producers of a lot of products, and they built more arms than the, uh, than the Americans did. But they didn't actually build products in quantities that people actually wanted to purchase them or in uh, quality levels, or in the right kind of varieties. So, the, uh, that photo below is of, like I said, in, uh, it's in Havana, central Havana actually. And the old Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev uh, was his sponsor in Cuba during the Cold War. Um, Russia sent money out to keep a lot of these communist satellite countries around the world going. And Cuba looks poor there went to absolute destitution uh, once that money tap turned off. But Mikhail Gorbachev went to America on a state visit. He's taken on a tour of a supermarket and it's just astounded that there were several dozen different brands of margarine. He said, well, in the Soviet Union we have one margarine, why would you need any more than one? He sort of looked around at the reduced salt, at the reduced fat, at the ones that had olive oil extract through them and, and all the rest, and said, why would anyone want that? Well, the fact is that they did. And in the old USSR, when you had the Ministry of Margarine uh, telling supermarkets how much margarine they, they would be allotted for the month ahead, there's no mechanism to say, well, actually, people want something a bit different or a bit better. Or maybe they want smaller uh, 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 tubs of margarine that fit in better. You assume they wanted this big thing that would last them a month. Well, it's heavy to lug home, and after three weeks it's gone off anyway. Uh, listen to your customers a little bit. But when you have that centralised authority that's remote from information and from price signals you can't be informed on what people actually want. And similarly, like on this uh, the shelf up here, if, the, if those providing products don't have information on what's needed or wanted, you either get excesses or shortages. Again, it's a price system. Woolworths down the road have real-time um, uh, stock management systems. As soon as something's taken off the shelf, in many cases, the computer knows, it records it, and when a certain threshold is hit, an automatic order is sent out to the suppliers for new stock. And the latest that happens is when it, uh, when an item is actually scanned through the checkout. So if you take, a, uh, say, a bottle of water off, uh, off the dispenser, the dispenser can sense it, uh, a... Um, uh, say a mound of avocados in the fruit and veg section can't sense an individual avocado has been taken but as soon as it goes through the checkout five minutes later automatically that gets added to the inventory they didn't do that in the old Soviet Union that's not the way a top-down economy is designed the system I'm talking about with Woolworths is absolutely bottom-up and consumer-oriented and consumer-driven so, the, uh, one of the final points I've got there is monopoly. Now, producer-led systems love monopolies. They rely on them with all their resultant problems for the consumer in terms of price, uh, quality and service. And again, if you don't have any competitive pressure, this lady behind the counter here, she has a monopoly. Like I said before, why is she going to put in any effort to spruce up her shop a bit, to provide more products than what she has? I've been into a shop that looked like that and the guy working behind the counter was actually just sitting on the phone. He had a landline, they didn't have mobile phones yet, he was just relying on the landline. And just talking to his friend about the baseball. Why? Because he didn't care. It wasn't his shop, his public servant, he couldn't be fired. The people running the joint were remote in, uh, in the Ministry of uh, Groceries in Havana. They didn't know what he was getting up to, whether he was on the phone or not. 
The only consequences were that customers not, might not get served, but because he had no skin in the game, it wasn't his profit or loss, he's going to be, uh, be employed whatever, he really didn't care. So every two or three minutes he'd sort of lean over and point at someone, and if you didn't tell him quickly what you wanted, or if he didn't have it, he'd just, just say, oh, no, and just go back to his phone conversation. It's incredible. You compare that to service in a market economy where the customer is king, it's a different world entirely. So you can flick over to a different Cuban shop here. I, was, uh, I, I did see some like this. Not quite as nothing as nice as that actually. Um, assuming that's Cristal beer, not Cristal champagne. Very unlikely um, in Cuba. When you look at this, it's a nicer looking shop. Uh, it's stocked for tourists. This is a tourist only shop, and that's why it has more products. Looks neater. Um, won't be restocked in real time. Um, when products run out, they run out and you hope that they come back sooner or later. So you sort of do get what you get on the day. You look at some of these products, they're these sort of brands. Thanks, Hannah. You're not going to get your double coated dark chocolate Tim Tams. You're going to get plain Locally packaged biscuits, the packaging looks cheap and like it's already falling apart. The biscuits look like cardboard. I had one, threw the rest of them in the bin. Um, and yet at the same time, you look across the top here, the range of alcohol is huge. Uh, I remember buying rum, uh, just a rum bottle as a tourist. And their standard rum bottle, $7, it's amazing stuff. Makes you think I'll never go and buy their, uh, anything else again. Um, apparently Havana Club, which sells maybe a $40 a bottle or so here, that's just the rubbish that they export to, to foreigners. Sort of like Foster's beer, you have to go to Bali to drink it. We, we, we get rid of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, they clearly have a competitive advantage in producing rum, but you can't get a bottle of water. And that was the problem I had going into some of these shops, saying, okay, well, you know, I just like a bottle of water, hot day outside, 35 degrees, you know. And they said no. And remember the bloke behind the counter put up and said, oh, we have lots of rum if you like some of that. I said, well, actually, no, yeah, maybe later on tonight. So what would Cuba be better off doing? Export some of this great product, don't just stock it on shelves locally, and then re import bottled water, the things that you don't do quite so well. So, uh, to get a little more technical on it, what this all comes down to is uh, Hayek's fatal conceit. So, Ron's friend uh, F.A. Hayek, whom I mentioned before, is a, a legendary economist, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, it's not just us who like him, as Ronald Reagan uh, welcomed his uh, economic views and policies into the Reagan administration, which really is one of the most successful economic administrations in US history, if not the most successful. Uh, when Hayek wrote about what he called this fatal conceit, it was about those who believe, and we're not here to disparage them, um, they may believe in all good faith that they're doing the right thing, but they're not when they believe that economic systems can be planned centrally right down to the number of cereal packets stocked in Woolworths down the road or the number of avocados in the fresh fruit section. So to F.O. Hayek, civilizations grew because he had societal traditions that placed importance on private property that led to exchange, expansion, trade and eventually the modern capitalist system and its extended order. Hyde believes that this demonstrates how there's a key flaw in statist or socialist thought which says that changes can only be efficient if they're purposefully designed by the smartest people sitting on high and prescribing them to all of those down below. He said that socialist economies can't be efficient for one vital reason, because dispersed knowledge is required in a modern economy. That price signals are the only means of enabling each 
economic decision maker to communicate their own tacit knowledge, their dispersed knowledge to each other, in order to understand what goods and services are acquired, in what specifications, in what quantities, at which times and at which locations. So, put quite simply, no one in Canberra can decide what's the best way for each of you to come here today. You, are, you each make your own decisions based on your own preferences, the set of information as you see them. Uh, I think one person called her, texted me earlier and said that there, were, there was a, a public transport issue, the trains were running a bit slow. Would someone in Canberra have known that in time? Uh, very unlikely not. So it all comes down to the fact that, look, it would be nice if we could have things designed on high from us, but the knowledge that you need actually is at the grassroots level and needs to be fed up to producers. So we need a consumer-led approach as opposed to a designed, producer-led, top-down approach. So to finish up, look, trade happens because different people in different areas with different capabilities develop specialties. They find it easier to produce more of their own specialty and trade it for the specialty of someone else, rather than try and create everything themselves. And there's an old saying that someone in sales can sell ice to Eskimos and sand to Arabs, which is quite a feat. Even harder would be for the Eskimo to find sand. I mean, how far is he going to have to dig down through the ice and the water below to find the continental shelf? And likewise, harder for that Arab to create ice. He's trying his hardest to have his skiing holiday. Um, he doesn't look like he's too thrilled with it. But in each case, the two of them can trade. The Eskimo can give ice to the Arab, the Arab can send some sand to the Eskimo, and they would both be better off for it. Otherwise, they simply wouldn't choose to do it in the first place. Okay, now that concludes today.